shout, I've been delivered. I've been delivered. Ain't no devil gonna hold me down. I'm coming out of my cave. I'm coming out of my shell. I may come out of my body. I've been delivered. Thank you, Brother Jason, Cisco, and thank you, wonderful people, for receiving the word of the Lord and responding and God putting his benediction and blessing upon it and speaking a word to us. I'm thankful. I know you're hungry. I know you're tired, but just think how good it'll feel when you do get out of here and go eat. So stay awake a little bit longer, and we're going to have a wonderful time, and we're going we're gonna to tell that sister she's delivered. She's delivered. Now you got to accept it. Just stand up from there and clap your hands and rejoice and shout and say, I've been delivered. Just stand on your feet. Just tell her to stand on her feet there. Just tell her to stand on her feet. Just tell her to stand on her feet and shout, I've been delivered. 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 Let me just tell you, there's been some strongholds that's been pulled down. Before I let you sit down, let me just tell you this. Say, strongholds. Strong. Say, we've pulled some down. Strong. We've pulled some down. And that precious Brother Nickerson, wasn't he awesome this morning? And then Brother Jason Sisko. And you've got this thorn between these roses. But you know what I felt? That there were some strongholds being pulled down. You know what a stronghold is? Our pastor preached that way. Um, it is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes you to accept it as unchangeable. Well, we just heard that the word of the Lord, Esther doesn't have to stay down here like this. She's aiming for the stars. You hook your wagon to this star, honey, you go in places. You'll come out of Bethlehem and go all the way to New Jerusalem. Something that you know is contrary to the will of God was, you were delivered of that right now. When strongholds are established in the life of an individual, say Satan moves right on in there to occupy those positions. And you crack the door, honey, and he's in there. And he's taking full control. And it takes somebody just a shaking you and a spitting in your face and a kicking your shins and a shaking you to get you out of it. I don't want no strongholds. I just want a soft, tender touch laid on me and just, oh, it don't take much to wake me up. Just a little tiny move and I'm there. They don't have to spit in my face or kick my shins or shake me around. You can be wounded through words or circumstances. And if those wounds are allowed to fester. I was hurt in my church. I was hurt. I I'm glad Jason mentioned that. People are using those as crutches and alibis and all of that. Say, we got rid of all of that today. Now, come on, and, and, and we're going to do some more of that kind of stuff. But if those wounds are allowed to fester, they can evolve into a stronghold into which they anger, say anger, anger. say bitterness, bitterness. Hatred. hatred, jealousy, malice or strife. We need, to, we need to shake every snake off in this fire here today. Just take your hand and say, get off of me. I'm shaking everything off. Bitterness, wrath, malice, strife. Hallelujah. Oh, so I want to get rid of all of that. Well, before you're seated, and uh, we may change gears here just a little bit. You can't just stay in one gear all the time. That's what you got to understand. It's some, sometimes I just have to back off 
and say, hey, wait a minute here. I got to get a new look at this. And we just heard Revelation preaching. And now we're going to go into something a little bit uh, different. But I want you to just raise your hands and thank God for what He's doing in your own individual life. And we're, we're setting this field on fire. Hallelujah. Pull down every stronghold. Get rid of everything. Shake off every viper into this fire that's being built. And everybody clap their hands and praise the Lord and you may be seated. You may be seated. Now, I know you can just take so much and I know you're hungry, but like I said, it'll sure be good when you get there. So stay awake with me. A professional golfer stands in the fairway 275 yards away from the green. His caddy stands beside the golf cart a few feet away. And there are different clubs for different purposes. And uh, this golfer, this golfer saying, uh, I'm a professional. Intuitively, I know which club to use to get the job done that I desire. So knowing the kind of prayer that you need and how to pray, this precious, young, anointed, apostolic, young man called of God has just stood here as Mordecai. And he has told us that he was there guarding the presence of God. But you know how he guarded that? By howling. Say howling. howling. In the streets. In sackcloth. And in ashes. And he was guarding. He was sending messages. But he was howling. I want you to just hang on to that for just a minute. Sometimes we're going to need a different golf club to just knock it as far as we want to knock it. And then we lay that one down and pick up another one. So it is a vital secret to your prayer life to know whether it is a confession prayer that you need. Say a confession prayer. Say a thanksgiving prayer. Or a petition prayer. Or an intercession. That's never for yourself. That's always for somebody else. Say supplication. And to help you with that, I like to use this as mine. I came up with this. I don't know whether it fits. But when Jesus in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, it's with strong, say strong, strong. cryings and even tears. Say with supplication. With supplication. To me, he was suffering the Lord God for what was planned for him in the days of his flesh on the days of this earth so that he might fulfill it. And that's why he even prayed uh, when they were trying to throw him over the cliff. He did not want to die any other way, only the excruciating death on the cross. So he suppled his own, the will of God. That's why in the garden he wrestled with the will of God. So supplication to me is one of the strongest forms of prayer. And God said in Zechariah, he was going to pour out the spirit of what? Supplication on Israel. And that's when they're going to supple him. Now show us. And then that uh, revelation is going to come forth. So uh, confession, thanksgiving, petition, intercession, uh, supplication. And then what else? Say praise. Praise is a, it, it, it's a combative force. It, it's, it's, another, it's another club. It's another club. So I don't just use, and I'm going to get even into talking in tongues, but every utterance, say every utterance, accommodates a need in this world and in this life. Even maybe the spoken word of faith, it's combative. It's forceful. And various forms of standing in prayer to resist the devil. Now, let's settle this right now. We're in war. There's not, a, there's not a one in this room that their back is not to the wall with something. You don't need to feel individual or go to feeling sorry for yourself and go to sucking on your thumb. We've all got problems. We are in a war. And if you let any of that keep you from warring back and coming on to church and warring in this place, I'm sorry, folks, we're going to lose the battle. And now you've heard the revelation. So every period 
of church history has experienced spiritual warfare, ever. There's never been a generation. We've got it better in some ways than any generation has ever had it. And it will blow your mind what the next generation is going to have that will be inconceivable of us even right now. One of the ministers that sat with me last week on that little uh, platform showed me his watch that he stores into that watch. Every member of his church and everything about them, he doesn't have to ask, ask for a Rolodex or call his secretary. He just punches that, da 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 And it is full of information, that one little watch. We are entering into the most sophisticated age of all generations. But there will never be a generation that's not at war because it began in heaven and it will wind up in the great tribulation when he comes back on those horses and we come with him and he's going to do battle with all of that. I'm sorry, we are at war. You'll never get to lay your clubs down. You'll never get to, you'll never get to lay them down. And as the end draws closer, say the devil will pull out all of his stops. So be ready for it. Spiritual warfare is a reality for this church today. And the Bible mentions the theme of war with uh, many, many, many times, even describing, say, our Lord as a what? Warrior. Say, he's a warrior. That's what Exodus 15 and 3 says. The Lord is a warrior. Yea, Jehovah is his name. So the first spiritual battle, as we said, took place in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels fought. I have to tell you this to tell you something good. Uh, and he fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought. And his angels, Revelation 12, 7 and 8. And uh, prevailed. They prevailed not. That's what I want you to get a hold of. Say they prevailed not. Come on, get it. Say they, did, they fought, but they didn't prevail. They didn't prevail. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. We're fixing to wipe the slate clean. Say, Michael and his angels were created for battle. They didn't come against Lucifer with fluttering wings on fluffy clouds of glory. So say, they fought. And they what? That's what I want you to get. Say, they fought. And they won. And that's what's important. And we should always go into every service, every week, get up on Monday morning. You'd like to sack out, but you get up on Monday morning and you enter back into warfare. You're building up for the weekend, so on Wednesday night you can have an explosion. I don't care if it's a Bible study, I don't care what it is. Say, so we're going to have an explosion. It's too late to be normal. It's too late to think small. It's the end time. we got to do it quick. we got to get with Him and have a sovereign move of God. So we've got to be determined, say, to win. We, we're, we don't want a spiritual Vietnam on our hands. We don't want a bunch of victims and, and, and uh, military uh, casualties. And we've got to go into this with a clear mind, with a made-up heart, clean hands, pure heart, our minds made up. You've got to enter into spiritual warfare, say, with a determination to fight to the finish and win and unless you've won you have a finish because you're a winner so fight to the finish so we're going to fight and we're going to claim victory and we've got to enter spiritual warfare just knowing that we're going to be the winners there are many among us say they talk the talk but they won't walk the walk they won't battle they won't walk the walk so as we get closer to the end and we get closer to the coming of the Lord, say spiritual warfare is going to intensify. We're not called to fight a little minor battle. We're fighting major battles and we've got to intensify as he intensifies on your home and everywhere. And so Paul said, and I, I, I leave you just with this and move on to my lesson. It is true that I'm not in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5 where he gave us his job description. He said, it is true that I'm not an ordinary, weak human being. I don't use human plans and methods to win my battles. I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by men, to knock down the devil's strongholds. These weapons can break down every proud argument against God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. And with these weapons, 
I can capture rebels, bring them back to God, change them into men whose hearts desire as obedience to Jesus Christ. And he said, this works mightily in me. Just tie me up to anybody in 15 minutes. I'll have them. I'll have them convinced that this is the truth. Are you hearing me? I'll have them convinced. They had to change his guards every 15 minutes because Paul won them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he said, take unto you the whole armor of God. And as you said, uh, this church holds the leverage to the, I don't care if you've got just a feeble hand, you hold the leverage to the greatest power in all the world. And you have all of heaven backing you. Angels can't do what you do, but they can just back you up. All the ages is backing us up. They're all in the grandstands watching how we play ball. Don't sit in the grandstands at church. You play ball with us. Say their eyes are upon us and say we're looking. So let me just tell you one more thing we need besides those mighty weapons that the Apostle Paul told us in Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. And I'm not taking time to read those because you've read them time and time again. Taking under you the whole armor of God. But there's another powerful weapon that say that's the anointing. Now come on. The Lord God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Uh, I, I want to tell this precious man that preached this morning, Brother Nickerson, that my father was a one God, Jesus named Holy Ghost, tongue talking, devil chasing, uh, apostolic preacher. One God, what, he said, you better get that settled in your mind in Jesus' name, baptism. And then when he went to pray for a woman that's in our church today, she, was, she is a minister. She pastored in Galveston, Texas. She was in the hospital dying. He pastored in Beaumont, Texas. He drove over there. Brother Anthony was a little boy, went with him. He walked in that room with that one God, Jesus name, Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, an hours a day of prayer and knew this book like he knew the back of his hand. And he walked in there and said, Devil. The doctor walked out and said, She won't be here very long. He walked in there and said, Devil. Uh, death, there's not room enough for me and you both in here. One of us is going and I'm not going. That's what, you, that's what you've got, Brother Nixon, when you stand and rejoice about that. And so God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. We're talking about the flesh, the days of his flesh. The flesh is just as real as his almightiness is real. And, and he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, this afternoon is this, that the Lord is a warrior. And let me tell you, 1 John 3 and 8 tells us, For this purpose, God Almighty manifested himself in the flesh. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might do what? De the what? Works of the devil. I want everybody to memorize that. Say, God became a man. That's why you believe in one God, folks. And just to believe in one God is not going to save you unless you believe why that one God was manifested. There would have been no Calvary if that man of God hadn't been, if God Almighty hadn't been manifested in the flesh. You wouldn't have even known how to win souls. You wouldn't even know how to pray. God became a man. God is one God manifested in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil. I want to talk about how he did it. I want to talk about how God Almighty, for this purpose, God became a man. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, in the New Testament, you will see the culmination and fulfillment of God's plan and purpose in equipping us for spiritual combat. Because God is going to have a counterpart in this earth. That's this bride. God is going to have a co-regent. He's going to have uh, he, He's going to have a co-heir. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He's going to have a wife to sit with him in the throne. She's going to stand shoulder to shoulder with him. We're in this together with Him. Whatever He did, we are to do. He became a man to get us. And so, in the New Testament, He is going to teach us why He was manifest in the flesh. And the best example for us to examine and to emulate is this. That God has come to do battle with the devil. And I want you to understand that God had said in this church... Uh, he had said in this church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, say helps, governments, and say diversities. Here we come with some more what? Clubs. Here we come with some more clubs. Say diversities of tongues. We're going to talk about a warring tongue. We're going to talk about a devotional tongue. 
We're going to talk about a, uh, a birth tongue. We're going to talk about a congregational tongue that needed to be interpreted a while ago. But when I get home in my own prayer, I want to talk about that warring tongue. I want to talk about that tongue that can just chase the devil out of your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say diversities of tongues. And say each of those utterances is going to serve or to accommodate a different need down here. Now, we know that tongues are the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We know that there's tongues for uh, interpretation. And we know that there's tongues for edification that releases the anointing, builds faith, pulls people out of the fire. Did you know that? Jude said, praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Building up your most holy what? Faith. Faith. Pulling them out of the what? Fire. So Holy Ghost prayer can pull people right out of the fire. Because it builds up your faith. And the, and the prayer of faith is the only prayer that's going to be answered. So the prayer of faith, Holy Ghost talking in tongues, pulls people right out of the fire. You just wore the devil and you unfasten and you unshackle them. So uh, tongues of in intercession, uh, and uh, we've got that, is one of our best weapons of warfare. Jude says it builds up your most holy faith. So in the Gospels, we see Jesus as a powerful warrior with a new set of combat tactics and with one consuming passion in this life, that's his mission, is to destroy, and I want you to get that. We've come today to learn how to destroy the works of the devil. That's what warfare is. When he healed the sick, he was destroying the works of the what? Thank you. Say, before the foundation of the world, he was the lamb for sinners slain. It's the will of God for your body to be healed. But somebody is going to have to use combat tactics to unshackle you and to drive sicknesses out of your body, to drive strongholds out of your body, to pull down diseases and to set people free. He even raised the dead with combat tactics. Cast out devils. Are we still doing that? Do we believe in that in Canada? Yes. Casting out devils. And he challenged the traditions of the Pharisees. I'm going to tell you how he did it. And I want you to follow me. He was confronting the rulers of darkness. You're not up against a little uh, snake in the Garden of Eden. You're down here 6,000 years later. Up, That little snake has become a what in Revelation? Say a dragon. Say in one place he's, de he, he's depicted. You can't even describe him. We don't know what he is. We don't know whether he's a bear or a lion or, a, or whatever. Say that's what we're up against. We're confronting the rulers of darkness as did Jesus in his day. He confronted sickness. He confronted death. He confronted devils and cast them out. He challenged the traditions of the Pharisees. And he was confronting the rulers of darkness. Now look at his earnestness, his passionateness, his fervency. Say he prayed shamelessly, indecorously, sleeplessly, sleeplessly, sleeplessly. He who came to destroy the works of the devil... When they bring to him one that is deaf, get this, listen, don't miss it. With an impediment in his speech, Jesus put his fingers into his ears and say he spit and he touched his tongue. But get this, he looked up to heaven, he sighed, and he said, be opened. Now the Greek word used here is stenazo, which is translated in Romans 8.23 as groan when he sighed in the spirit. When he sighed, he was really groaning in the spirit. First he sighed or groaned, and then he used the rhema, the word. And when he spoke the word after he had what? Thank you. Thank you. Because you're confronting the what? The darknesses and the evil of this world and the rulers of darkness and the things that's got a hold of people that we cannot penetrate. There's no need to speak the word until we groan against what's got them bound now. There's no need to come preach the sermon until you've knocked down everything, every stronghold that's got them bound and they can't even get the revelation of truth. I hope you understand this. He sighed, which means he groaned, and then he used the rhema. Immediately the ears were opened and the string of his tongue loosed and he spake plainly, but it was through this process. He groaned in the spirit and then he spoke the word. He did some strange things even before that, folks. We are not a regular run-of-the-mill people. 
There may be a time just like this young man jumped up on that pew there to a lot of people. They would say, how dare he step up on our... Hey, Ezra pulled his hair out to get the attention of his generation. Isaiah almost became a streaker. We won't talk about that, but I'm just going to tell you, folks. I'm just going to tell you that it's no small thing to get the attention of this generation. They've seen everything. They've heard everything. They've felt everything. We've got to become a people that knows how to use these clubs, these combat tactics, variety of tongues. And the Pharisees now, this is the second one. Watch this one. The Pharisees come forth. They begin to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. He sighed in his spirit because that's what they came for. And said, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign given unto you in this generation. And in Mark 7, Jesus sighed, groaned, and brought forth a physical healing. And in Mark 8, when the Lord was being tempted, he also used groans for a way of deliverance to be open to him. I'm telling you that the groaning there made a way of escape for Jesus when they were tempting him. The groaning, you will not come out of the situations that you're in until you know how to use that club of groaning in the spirit. I groaned in the spirit yesterday to get here today. I'm not, I'm not storing to you. I groaned in the spirit. Now Sister Tenny is groaning in the spirit. And so those that were watching me and that got off of that plane with me here and that they saw I was moving my lips, but there was something. <laughs> I don't know. I guess they thought I was in pain. But I said, don't mind me. I'm in a situation and I'm talking to God. You just go ahead and do your... I'm telling you, we're up against some things, folks, and you don't need to be embarrassed about it. I don't mean that you have to altogether be so uh, inconventional that people would think and would not accept what you're trying would be the only reason I would care that I could just keep their goodwill so that they'll keep listening to my message. I'll keep the messenger so they'll keep listening to my message. All I'm telling you is that we're confronting some things that when Jesus confronted those things, he groaned in the spirit. He sighed. And then he did the operation of the thing. We'll never have what we're supposed to have until we bombard and until we unshackle and until we absolutely saturate this whole area with prayer and put a shield about this church and, a bed, and again around our leaders and unshackle the... Uh, uh, would you think there were any backsliders in this area or in your area? Let's see your heads. Do you think God is still married to the backslider? Do you think some groaning in the spirit could wake them up at night and let them come to the church as many did last week and the week before? And a doctor fixes to commit suicide and call and say, meet me there. Hey, it was prayer that woke them up and got them there. I'm telling you, somebody's got to groan in the spirit. If you walked in there right now, you would hear people groaning in the spirit. And they're walking off the streets and said, what's that noise? I felt something when I was driving by here. I felt something while I was walking by here. And come in there and, and, and be unshackled and pray through to the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, anywhere is a good where. Are you hearing me? Are you understanding? If you get this revelation, then you don't do this, folks. The revelation is no good. If you understand who Esther was and what she came to do, and then you don't do it, baby, you may be set aside too. I'm telling you. Because God's looking for a chosen, God's looking for an empty vessel. He wants somebody that will groan with Him, sigh with Him, reach with Him, say, destroy, destroy the works of the devil with Him. Go ahead and clap your hands. I know you're tired and hungry. When things begin to confront you and when the devil brings enticement and unbearable circumstances and situations and uh, and, and your faith seems to falter if you will yield to the Holy Ghost and, and, and I want you to just realize that you can yield to the Holy Ghost to the Spirit and begin to groan in the Spirit and, and the Holy Ghost will make a, an escape will be opened unto you it will help your infirmities and will make a way of escape say I need a deliverance I need a deliverance and say God said he was going to fix it for me but I've got to groan in the Spirit to bring it to pass if Jesus groaned, if he sighed, why didn't he just put his hand on him and go right up? Oh, no. He was confronting the darkness. He went by the pattern that you and I have got to go by to destroy the works of the devil. Right. Right. 
So in, in John 11, say Lazarus had died. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down. You know the whole story. I'm not even going to stay there because I'm not going to keep you too long this evening. And, and he groaned in the spirit when he saw her weeping and all the Jews weeping. He groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. Say, this is God. This one mighty God in the days of his flesh is groaning in the spirit. And he was troubled. And the word groan here, uh, embryo may I, which means to snort. You don't want to accept that? Well, you listen. To snort as a horse in fear or in anger. They flare their nostrils and they make terrible noises. He was troubled, which means to stir up or to agitate. So when he is facing death, when he is facing a bigger enemy than an impediment of speech or, or ears, he is facing him head on and he's got to destroy the works of the devil. He's groaning. Now look at this. Jesus, God in the flesh. He's making funny noises. He's troubled. He's stirred. He's agitated. Is he the resurrection and the life? Then why did he do all of this, folks? Come on and answer me. I need to know why he's doing all of this. You say, well, God said he was going to do it. Bless God, we're just going to sit here and wait and expect the Lord. He'll never do it. Somebody is waiting over yonder that's groaning. Somebody over there is uh, snorting. Somebody over there is howling in the streets. Somebody over there is saying, come on by here, Lord. Somebody is praying. Somebody is fasting. Somebody is calling on you. Somebody is speaking your word. Say he's stirred up. He's agitated. He's not happy with the situation. Is there any situation in your life you're not happy about? Are you ready to groan about it? How about even snort about it? How about even sigh about it? How about even cry about it? Now watch this. So Jesus, what? Thank you. Look at what Holy Ghost tears could do. It is, it is the thing that redeemed my life having received the Holy Ghost since I was five years of age, but being an authentic little girl and an authentic woman. My father was, was this man that kept Esther. My father, but I would watch him. I would listen to him, and he would pray at night for our needs. I would hear him groan in the spirit, and it marked me. I would watch him as he'd go out on the back porch, and I would watch through the window. I would hear him, and I'd want to follow him because it drew me. And I wanted to go there. And I'd see the moon coming down on that face. And I'd see the tears flowing. And then I'd hear somebody knock on the door. Brother Gibson, something just told us that your family was in need. And we brought you a basket of groceries. Or the next time it was, we know that your old Model T Ford is just about over with. And we, we know, and, and, and we brought you a car note. I'm just telling you folks that that's the way it used to be. And now it's like they said, we're surrounded with so many good things till you don't even have to pray for that anymore. So God's putting a lot of other things on us. He's putting a lot of other things on us that you're going to have to groan a little bit. You're going to have to howl in the streets a little bit. You're going to have to sigh a little bit. You say, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I'll ever have to do that. Yes, every one of us will be in the corner. We'll be handcuffed. And something, if you're going to unshackle your children, if you're going to set the church free, if you're going to redeem your own life, there's going to be some groaning, sighing, crying, howling, mourning, warring tongues, militant tongues, attacking, confronting, tearing down strongholds. I saw one woman last week in our church, and I never saw such a sight in all of my life, but I will. I will not be able to stand here and tell you the results because it involved a lot of things. But she had done that, and she had done that and done that. But God was clearing up some things, and when it fell, it was like a bunch of dominoes that fell. But I saw her taking her finger, and she was praying with that warring tongue, a militant tongue. And she was attacking, and she was confronting the works of the devil. The works of the devil. So then all she had to do, she said, come forth. And she called him by that name, that, that individual's name. She said, come forth. And that individual came forth. Do you want it? Do you want that to happen to your son? Do you want that to happen to your girl? Do you want that to happen to your church? Do you want that to happen to your city? You, you've got to confront the forces of evil and the darknesses of this world. Jesus wept. Jesus was groaning. 
Jesus was snorting. Jesus was sighing. Jesus was stirred up, agitated, crying in the spirit. And Jesus hit Satan work head on, say, with powerful intercession. And Lazarus is lying in the tomb. He's been dead for four whole days. All of the Jews are standing around questioning why Jesus was not able to keep him from dying. Mary and Martha are brokenhearted and they're grieving. And Jesus had just taken his time because he knows what he's up against. And he knows it's hard work. Come on, folks, and understand me. It's not easy to deliver them. It's not easy to face death head on and say, Death, there ain't enough room in here for me and you both and I ain't leaving. That's not easy. It's not easy to face him head on and say, That's my boy and you're not getting him. I gave him to God and you're going to give him up. It's not easy to look at him and say, That's my girl and that's my grandchildren. Does anybody here have any of that kind? I'm telling you, folks, you're going to have to learn to groan in the spirit. Use militant tongues, attacking, confronting, say tearing down every stronghold, unshackling them so they can do the will of God. God will not trample on the sovereignty of their will, but you don't understand they're shackled. They're bound by strongholds. That we've got to bind the strong man in them before the stronger can come in. So all I'm asking you to do is to bind the strong man. Bind the territorial spirits that, that control this place. I don't care whether it's dope, alcohol, lust, perversion, underworld gangs, gangs in the streets. We're trying to do it in Alexandria. We just voted out. We will not let gambling come in there. And they just voted it out because we've been warring against it in warring tongues. Coming against it. Say that's the only way to handle all of that. Politicking wouldn't have gotten that done. We came against it. In the power with these clubs, different clubs, warring tongue, militant tongue. How many of you want your boy saved? You want your girl saved? You want your church to have a revival and then an evangelical thrust and bringing them in? We're going to have to confront the forces of darkness and the forces of evil because people are there and you might as well recognize it and an easy little, old, an easy little band-aid won't get the job done. Here, here, here we are, hopelessness, despondency. And Jesus comes making all these peculiar noises, groaning, sighing, weeping. What they don't realize is, is that Jesus is warring through intercession. You don't understand. You don't understand if you've never been there. And it is so hard on the body. But he's warring through intercession against the natural forces of death that have Lazarus bound up. Jesus groans in himself. He cometh to the grave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus told us to take away the what? And they took away the stone and I'm going to cut it short. And when he thus had spoken, say he cried with a loud voice. Lazarus come forth. But what had he done before that? Say he sighed, he groaned, he wept. Just a lot of those clubs that he was using knocking against the death. Are you hearing me? And then he comes there and he cried with a loud voice. Oh, this, this does something to me. Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, but he's still bound. Hey, just because you get them in there, honey, they still all bound up, trapped up, entangled. That, oh, yeah, you just got, that's like, a, that, that's like Elisha laying his body over the, uh, uh, over the dead boy. And he, how many times does... How many times does he sneeze? Come on, tell me. How many times? Seven times. Did he stop the first time he sneezed? No, I hear somebody sneezing, but I ain't giving up yet. I I've heard him sneeze twice, in fact, but I'm not giving up yet. I got to hear him sneeze about seven times. Hey, this is going to work. That we heard, It's going to work. This is what I'm telling you will work. Hallelujah. We're confronting the forces of evil and darkness. We're snatching them right out of the mouth of hell. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot and grave clothes. Jesus comes against these forces, breaks their authority, so that resurrection power, oh, and I want you to get this, can flow into Lazarus. Say resurrection power resurrection. had to flow into Lazarus. And that came, yes, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, but he just didn't stand there and do a little one, two, three. This was hard work on the flesh to do what Jesus did to raise Lazarus from the dead. They're not going to come forth, folks. It'll never be easy. There is no easy way. Calvary is not easy. Bethlehem wasn't easy either. And there are no easy ways. He has already broken the power of the enemy 
so he can command a Lazarus to come forth. But you can't command, a, a sermon won't bring him forth until we've got that other bound. Do you really believe that? Jesus did not, Jesus did. Peter didn't preach his sermon on the day of Pentecost till the Spirit began what? Flowing. The flowing of the Spirit. So we need the power and the authority to speak to our neighbors when we get on the plane so that people will look to us with, uh, and say, I feel something there. I'm telling you they do because if you've got it, you've got it. And it's the power that spoke this world into existence. It's the power that overshadowed Mary. She conceived of the Holy Ghost. I've got something so powerful in me. If I would groan and travail and use that warring tongue, that militant tongue, a variety of, uh, a variety of utterances, groanings, roaring out of Zion. It's all through the book. He roared out of Zion. Uh, howlings and sighings and cryings and other tongues are just a few of these diversities of utterances. Brother Mangan, I've heard him on many occasions. Once in Pena, Illinois, we were in a high school auditorium. It was a big city uh, uh, revival, and we were the one-night uh, speakers, and all of the city officials were there. Brother Mangan is preaching, and I'm sitting over there. I've just sung, and, uh, and, and Brother Mangan is preaching and goes into talking in tongues. And I, now you hear me, I thought, well, I, you know, these officials are here, and that's such a powerful sermon. I wish he would have gone on and kept preaching and, and let the spirit of the prophet be subject to the prophet. But you know, after he, it was not interpreted. It didn't need to be. When he got through preaching that night, here came a stalwart young man bouncing from the back, jumped on, top, jumped on that uh, platform at that high school auditorium, shook Brother Mangan's hand, talking in a foreign language, and, and Brother Mangan said, Sir, I don't know what you're saying. He said, Yes, you do. You just talk to me in that language. He said, If you were to cut my head off, I wouldn't know a thing in the world. Uh, that I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know what you were saying. And then he began weeping. He said, I'm a Mormon. Told Brother Mangan what he uh, said. And he said, I'm convinced. Got the Holy Ghost. Six months later was killed in a car wreck. God shut that whole service down because a man of God was using combative forces. And, and you're hearing me? And God reached out there and got that. No telling what this did a while ago. It was something that broke, that needed to break, and strongholds were pulled down in this meeting. Yes, and, and, and one time in South Bend, Indiana, and there was an atheist sitting there, and he comes up and shakes Brother Mangan's hand. He said, I've heard you do that twice. And he said, one, one time it was in what you say your Lord's native tongue is Aramaic. And he said that, and told him what he said. He said, I'm convinced this has changed me. We've got a, we've got a bundle of supernatural combative forces to come against and unshackle people and get this revelation into their mind. God has set in the church diversities of tongues and combative forces and everything that we do. I don't care if it's groaning. I hear you saying when somebody makes a point, hmm, well, that's powerful. God's doing something. That gives an amen. That gives, that gives an amen to it. So we need that power and authority to speak to our neighbors, even the gifts of the Spirit. Brother Mangan's mother and noble Berger, which is Sister, um, Sister Kinsey's brother, and Pop Mangan, pastor of the church in South Bend, Indiana. Gerald and I were there for revival. Nothing had broken. Nothing was giving. And it was dry and dead and twice dead and plucked up of the roots. And Mom Mangan and Noble Berger one night went into a holy laugh with each other that lasted for an hour and a half until their sides were sore even the next day. And they were pointing at each other, just dying laughing. And they who were there, it was at the close of the service day that were there. It happened to them and the holy, life, holy laugh just broke out on everybody. Do you know that a revival broke and 50 people got the Holy Ghost after that? <laughs> we've got to rely we've got to rely on these accommodations we've got to rely on these uh, on these what do I call them? say clubs so I've got a club I've got a club I don't care if it's laughing in the spirit I don't care what it is uh, I, I, as a little girl as a little girl uh, uh, I heard old, and, and, and you've heard me tell that I heard old grandma uh, Terry say, uh, old grandma Terry, her son was going to kill my father because he was preaching on time. And back there, honey, like 75, 70, how many years ago? 65. 
I was a little bitty girl. Now I'm 70. So uh, he comes in there. He's going after my father and his mother sitting there. But she always testified the same way every time. I love the Lord because I feel him way down in my hip of my that was it. Hickaba, hackaba, ho. Now that you say, and I used to ask my mother, I said, why does Grandma Terry say hickaba, hackaba, ho every time? <laughs> he said, the, she said the same way you say, may I have some, may I have some chicken, please? May I have some gravy, please? It's the same thing. She's saying the same thing. It may be hallelujah, glory to God, amen. Thank you, Jesus. When her son entered that door, she knew he meant business, and he was after my father. She stood where she was, and she pointed her finger at him, and she said, Hickaba, Hickaba, ho! Well, honey, he fell flat of his back, and just, got Lord just bounced him up and down. You don't know what we've done. You have no idea. Say, from Paul's body? With what? Handkerchiefs? Come on, talk with me. Does anybody know what Acts 19 says? Say, from Paul's body, went forth what? Handkerchiefs and what else? And aprons, just touching his body. And say, devils went out of people. Come on, talk. Say, devils went out of people. Say, people were healed. Say, what we've got has a lot of good things that we're not using yet. Every kid in our church wants an anointed handkerchief so when they take a test, they can take it in their purse or put it in their pocket and just rub it all over. Say, even Peter, come on, we're apostolic. Yeah, we've heard the, we've heard the revelation, now let's get to using it. Say, Peter, the apostle Peter, shut us, say, everywhere he wants. you don't want to believe that and you don't think it happened today I believe mine could oh you believe that sister Maggie you little old, oh yeah oh no you don't understand I know what I've got and that's the only thing this is the only area of my life that I'm bold in only but I know what I've got I don't have to depend on myself I can hiccup a hike up a hole Just hick of a hike of a hoe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm just I'm just about through, but I, I want to tell you one or two more things. You can sit down or stand up. I know you're tired. I know you're sleepy, but this is still a good session. I've been good. I've done real good. <laughs> you know why I'm doing that? To wake you up to get yourself out of all those fixes that he just talked about. Hey, every one of us can cry about something. We all go back and say, well, I was a preacher's kid and everybody made fun of me. And blah, 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 blah. I just prayed for him and went on and said, you're going to eat my dust, honey. I'm going on. I'm moving on. Okay? <laughs> You've got some shadows. You've got to realize that it works mightily in your anointing. That's what you've got to keep. That's what you've got to keep in mind. You've got to keep the anointing. You've got to keep these gifts activated. And I'm going to use every one of them. That's why I'm going to respect pastors and teachers and evangelists. That's why I'm going to respect all that because God set them as gifts in the church. I ain't messing with them. I ain't messing with them. But I want the, my gifts. These are mine. It works mightily in me. I'm going to reach everybody I can. If they're on the, I, I want them to hug on me and kiss on me. I'm hugging them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want them to get this. I want them to feel it. If I ever hug somebody and, and somebody don't think I should, you know what I'm doing? It's going to get on you. It's going to get all over you, too.
You don't know what I got, honey, and it's contagious. If you ever get a little touch of it, you're gone, baby. That's what I told those ministers sitting with me back there last week. I said, let me tell you what. They said, we're watching your uh, family life center. I said, when is the opening date and all this and that and that? I said, let me tell you what you watch. I said, there's people pouring in and out of that church. I told them this. I said, if my people, which are called by my name, and seek my face, turn, turn. Yes, yeah. That sounds like a warring tongue. <laughs> oh, I love it. Don't make fun of my talking in tongues. Let me tell you, that, that every utterance, that's coming from somewhere. I mean that. You know, you, they don't need play in church. That's like that man walking through the cemetery and read on there, not dead, just sleeping. He said, buddy, you ain't got nobody fooled but yourself. <laughs> You ain't got nobody fool but yourself. I got it. You can have it. I know what it's done for me. I know how it's kept me. I got my mind made up. I'm not looking no other place. I'm not looking no other direction. I'm fixed. I'm settled. I, I, we've got it. You, you can hear all. You can hear everything you want to hear. But honey, then you got to get out there and get with it. You got to say. So you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to become the bride. You got to become a Mordecai, howling, sighing, groaning, protecting. Keeping. Oh, you've got to go winning. And I'm, I'm out of here. Just one more thing. So, many are out there bound. Say they're dead in trespasses and sin. They'll never come forth until somebody groans and sighs and howls. Sackcloth and ashes. Or if you're in a revival and nothing seems to break it. One of those, one of those plugs. If one don't work, try the other club. Just ha-ha him right off of the stage. Just get the holy laugh. They've got a place in Pensacola where they're sitting out there in the hot sun to try to get into that church. Yeah, that's right. So she went in. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You can have part of my offering. <laughs> so, honey, she went down. They, they had to go to Florida. She went by there and saw that. She came back and she said, She knew that. See, she knew that. But she'd been exposed to the what? To the high level. She'd been exposed to the high level. She'd already tasted the best wine. She wasn't going to settle now for them. All I'm telling you folks, we got to hit the high level in this. We got to get in the high. It's got to go to working mightily in us. They, we're not coming behind in no gift. Say no gift. We're, we're going to use every club we got. We're going to love them. We're going to pray for them. We're going we're gonna to do everything we can. We're going we're gonna to do it all, but we've got to somehow understand that behind the scenes there's got to be groaning and sighing and crying. And before the power and the authority can be released with the reign of God, say there must be groanings, weepings, sighings, travailings in the spirit. Could anybody call on you at your local church as a man full of the Holy Ghost and faith that used these mighty weapons? Would you stick it out with your pastor as did Luke with Paul? when Demas forsook him, loving this present world, and keep using your mighty weapons? Would you be a John Mark? Uh, he would stand for saying, you would be profitable to me now. We're just winding this up. It's just four years, not quite that much to the turn of the century. Or would you say, or would, or would somebody say about you, uh, Alexander the coppersmith, he's done me a great harm, and the Lord reward him. It took an awful lot of talking in tongues for me to overcome him. All I'm begging you today, to, folks, is to say this. 
that I would want to spare my church, my leader. I would not want to destroy a man of God that God has placed in our church. I want to join forces and become united in prayer and fasting and use all of my clubs to get the ball out of the court. I want to do something that will get this church moving like it's never moved. I want to get as many souls as I can get. I want to reach as many people as I can reach. Hallelujah. I want to help as many. Hallelujah. 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 Say, I don't want to ever be the same. I, I know I'm hungry. I know I'm tired. I know I'm weary. I've been here all day. But say, i got something. And I'm going to leave here and I will go eat and I'll come back tonight. And don't tell us what kind of an explosion. Hallelujah. Clap your hands and say, i got some. I got some weapons. I got some clubs to use. Hallelujah. Say hiccup a hiccup a ho. Say groaning. Say howling. Weeping. Mourning. Mourning Zion. Hallelujah. Roar out of Zion. Let it happen. And God bless you. And here they come. God bless our pastor. Great man. Precious man. Beautiful spirit. And I want to give him a hand.